Hey, greetings, everybody. We're going to start pretty soon. We, we're like, you know, like a minute, you know, we got to start a little bit, not on time, you know, just to be consistent. But um, so, yeah, so we're going to have this amazing conversation with Rob DeMota. He's a Dion. He's a humongous, humongous person. And he just had one of the probably most revolutionary trips of this year, not this decade, going to Nigeria. So we're going to go into that. And before we, when we start, we're going to start soon, but we're going to play actually a video that um, the Rob shot while he was there and kind of like shows, you know, gives us kind of a feel for the experience. But we're just going to let a few more people come in um, just because, you know, people are coming in as we go. And so we're going to just let that go. And now you guys, you know, share the link, share the link to people. Um, let them know that, you know, we're live now and they should join in. And from there, we should uh, keep growing. And people come as a conversation goes on too as well. So we're just gonna give it a little bit more time. So yeah, so Rob, we're gonna start soon. Um, we're gonna start like just two minutes. We're gonna give another two minutes. People are coming in. Um, but as I said before, this is a, this is a historical, historical conversation um, that we're having right now. The trip that happened in Nigeria uh, arguably was the first of its like ever from an anthropological standpoint mixed with halakha. And um, we're gonna just, we're gonna fly in a second, but we're gonna start with a really good video. Um,
Okay, so we're about to start right now. Um, this is Rabbi Mordecai here, and this is a huge, huge honor that we're all, all of us are having right now to hear about this amazing, uh, amazing spiritual journey that Rabbi, <clears throat> that Rabbi Demota is has done in Nigeria, and we're going to talk about it in great detail. But before we start. Uh, we're going to see if this this works with this video, which is basically uh, like a mini documentary in a way, eh, maybe a little bit less than that. Mini documentary on. Uh, hold on. All right, hold on. Let's see if let's see if this works. Saying the screen sharing is on pause. Can you guys see this? No. Okay, so it's a screen sharing. It's paused. So why is it paused? I don't know. Go down. Okay, so we're just gonna we're gonna go now. We're just we're trying to. There's a video that we have. Yeah, it's it. We're trying to uh, play a video that the Rob took in Nigeria. It's a short video, but it's not coming up. It's not allowing me to share it. So my apologies on that. Um, whatever it is, what it is. Anyway, so Rabbi Mordecai here. And so we're gonna just we're gonna have this conversation. We're gonna start it, and maybe as we go, uh, with the Rob, we're, we're trying to get the video. So it's just, it's a little little technical issue, you know. It's a, it's a thing, but we may jump into it. But I think um, just you know just to start this conversation, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of conversations about uh, the Igbo people, you know, their history, what they're about. Um, in 2014. Um, a rabbi who's very, you know, close to, you know, many people here in Israel and around the world, Rabbi Chaim Konetsky, um, gave a ruling on the, the Igbo people, and he, get, he verified that they're descendants of the 12 tribes, and he had his own particular uh, shitot on how they reacclimate in, and at that time, other rabbanim and Rab Demota was one of the most vocal about uh, this whole uh, experience with the Igbo people. And he's actually took it even a step further. And not only did he poskin based off of the information that was there, and it wasn't just him, he's gonna talk about all the other rabbis who also made this decision. He actually physically went there and did anthropological work on the ground. And that's what makes this conversation historic and this, this the mission that he's went on historic. And so um, without any further ado, um, let's bring the Rav up and, and, and Rav, hold on, let me make sure. Uh, okay, so the Rob is unmuted. Rabbi, how are you? I'm doing well, very well. Amen, amen, amen. So I just, uh, let me ask you, did you have any, I mean, I didn't really say I was going to ask you this, but did you have any jet lag coming back from? Uh, Not like really, uh, because I'm, I'm currently living in Europe, in Belgium. Ah. So it, the time difference is only one hour. Oh, okay, fair enough. Okay, that's fair enough. And then let me ask you this just an outside question. How did you recover from the, the food? Because you had all this spicy food in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Very good down. question. Well, that was a challenge the entire month. Uh, eating foods that I was not used to for a long time. I mean, when I lived in the Dominican Republic, a lot of the foods in Nigeria are similar, but the hot, without the hot spice. And I was not used to eating that every single day. And I had stomach issues the whole month, but uh, I don't regret the experience. I would do it again. 
Wow, wow. So for people who are, you know, who may not know about all your work and everything that you've been working on for the last, you know, decade and beyond that, uh, maybe you could give us a little bit about your background and and how you became a Dion. Not super detailed, but just a broad overview of okay. just how we got here. Go as long as you need. We got all night. So Okay. So for those that don't know me, my name is Yehonatan El Asal de Mota. I was born in Miami to Caribbean Sephardic parents. Uh, we are Spanish speakers at home and English outside of the house. Uh, my parents migrated from Dominican Republic in 1970s. I was educated in the mm -hmm. United States, in the state of Florida, Miami, primarily. I, can, I began my academic studies in aerospace engineering in 1999 on an academic scholarship at University of Miami. Uh, that degree took me. I changed my major about six times in a period of seven years and finally obtained a BA in liberal studies in 2007. In 2003, I started to study rabbinics under Chacham Yosef Ben Arosh of Blessed Memory at Magen Sephardic Congregation in North Miami Beach. And with him, I he took me as his apprentice in the way Sephardic Jews used to train rabbis in the old days before yes, the system of yeshivot uh, influence Sephardic uh, Jewry as it is today. And uh, we went everywhere. We went to do weddings, burials, um, uh, memorials, and we studied every single day, halakha, shuhan aruch, primarily, and gemara, morning and evening. And then, in 2007, I met Chacham Morecha Levi de Lopez, who's from Brazil, and we studied classical Sephardic methodology of Talmud. And we did that for many years. In fact, he gave me a homework assignment for, that, that took me 14 years to complete, after which I, he gave me Semicha as, as Dayan. And uh, that was signed by Chacham uh, Jacob de Levi de Oliveira, who is in Brazil at this moment. And um, let's see what else, I'm, I'm missing a lot of things <laughs> because I don't like to talk about myself. It's easier for other people to do that. Uh, in 2009, I moved to the Dominican Republic and I founded the Nithe Israel the, uh, Sephardic Congregation. And I was there for four years. After four years of living there, I decided to go back to the United States to continue my studies. And that's when I embarked on the journey of anthropology and religious studies under tutelage of Dr. Professor Tudor Parfit, Anna Bidegain, and also uh, Professor Albert Waku, who I learned anthropological methods from. And in uh, 2016, I graduated with a Master's of Arts in Anthropology Religious Studies at FIU, Florida International University. And in the summer, in the summer between moving from United States to Europe, I went to Israel for two months and was trained as a mohel. I was certified as a mohel by Chacham Yoel Nisim Dayan, who's in Bet Shemesh. I knew I was skipping something. I'm also, I, was also, I also studied the laws of Shahita. In 2008, 2009, I was uh, trained and certified as a shohet. And I trained four shohatim in the Dominican Republic so that they will be independent and not have this, the issues that we're having before I arrived to the country. Um, let's see what else. In 2000, 2021, I was awarded PhD in international law after defending my dissertation successfully, after which I moved to Portugal and then embarked on as a visiting professor at Universidade Lusofonia do Porto. I was there for just one semester. It was online in the middle of the pandemic. So that was kind of strange, uh, teaching university courses online. And then after that, a year later, that's when I received the Dayanut Semicha. And months later, I came back to Europe after a time in about 14 months in the United States. 
came back to Europe, this time with a postdoc at the University of Antwerp in the history department. I'm between two uh, disciplines, urban history and political history, where I am focusing on the issue of Portuguese Jews in the 18th century and halakha and international law, private international law. I am currently writing two books. One of them went, I sent the manuscript about three weeks ago uh, with University of Amsterdam Press. That book is going to be called Black Jews and Their Slaves. I know a lot of people are waiting for that. And uh, the second book should be finished by the end of this year and published by early 2024. That's a book that I'm co-writing with Professor Dr. Michael Broyd at Emory University at the Law and Religion Department. And that book is on the interaction between Jewish law and international law, past, present, and future. So that's, in a nutshell, um, some of the highlights of my studies. So first of all, that's extremely impressive. And as a person who's a new rabbi, you know, it's a lot, it's, 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 it's a lot of uh, things you put out there that are very inspirational and it should be uh, inspirational for everyone listening. I want to uh, say as well that, you know, I never, I never wanted or envisioned myself being a rabbi, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Rosh, a blessed memory. I, I tell people the story. He tricked me because uh, I just wanted to be a knowledgeable Jew to be able to raise a, a kasher Jewish family. That's what I wanted. Amen. And he took me under his wing and trained me in everything that he knew that he could in the years that he had. And, um, and one day he just surprised me. He said to me, uh, Yehonatan, you have to learn how to do the Keriyat Torah because it is shameful for a rabbi not to be able to read. And I said, what, rabbi? <laughs> it's like, uh, this, this, is, this is what he did. So he, he trained me without telling me what he was doing. Years later, after he passed away, it dawned on me that, that what he was doing was, he was training me as, as if I were his son, because he only had daughters. He didn't have boys. So I was, I was his son. Ooh. So every, everything I do, I always remember him, because I, live, I keep his memory alive. Amen, amen. He should live forever at the highest of in Shemaim. Let me ask you this. So tell us a little bit about the, the court that you work with, the international circuit of, of rabbis and, and how you guys uh, function? Great, good question. So in 2014, after a number of trips going back and forth between Israel and the Dominican Republic, I, I, came, I came up with the idea of, of organizing a bet din, an international bet din, which would empower and edu through education, the disenfranchised and marginalized Jews in Latin America. That was how we started. And at that time, there were seven rabbis on the board. To this day, there are five. Two of them have left for personal reasons. And uh, so currently, we have uh, Dayan Jacob de Oliveira, who's in Brazil. We have also Rabbi Hanania Cohen, who lives in Israel and Gush Etzion in the north with the border of Lebanon. Uh, Rabbi Dayan Eliezer Tabor, who lives in Eli in uh, Samaria, and uh, Rabbi Chaim, Ov Chaim Ovadia, who many of you may know of him. Uh, he has a Sephardic U and Torah Ve'ahava, and, um, and myself. And uh, we have other liaisons who, who we consult and who work with us as well such as Rabbi Ariel, Moshe Ariel Abel, Abel, or Abel, who lives in the UK. And um, with, with the passing of time, we realized, uh, after speaking to one of my colleagues, Eliezer Papo, who lives in Jerusalem, who's also a professor at Ben Gurion University, he, he told me, why, why do you limit yourself to only Sephardic Jews? This vision that you have of the Obadiah Alliance should be something that's international, should be global. And it dawned on me at that time, I was like, you know, he has a point, he has a point. And, um, and that's, when, that's when I, under my direction, the Obadiah Alliance started to open the borders to 
other communities that are not Sephardic. And the first, the first project I would say was the Igbo, the Igbo, uh, Igbo Israelites of Nigeria and other regions of West Africa, which I will talk about in a little bit. And um, yes, it was very controversial, but it was something that had to be said because I realized that there has been an enormous amount of research that we cannot deny, number one. Number two, there have been also historical writings, rabbinic writings in their context between Igbos and Jewish communities going as far back as the 17th century. Also, we, there have been contemporary uh, rulings on the Igbos and many Haskamot. I met, I was just, uh, when we met in Israel this past uh, April, yeah. I met a gentleman, an Igbo gentleman who's been living in Israel for 40 years. He's been fighting for, with the state of Israel to get the Igbos recognized. And he, he had a book, a very thick binder, full of documents, everything written in Hebrew on the customs of Igbos and history. Like, I mean, he, he, had, he had way more than what I could ever imagine. Wow. And on top of that, he showed me all the various rabbinic letters, rabbis from the USA, from Canada, from Israel, from Italy, agreeing on all the information that he had. Even chief rabbis accepted all this information. The issue is with the state of Israel. And, and, and so when I met him, he wanted to share all these things with me. And this is why I'm saying that it was, it was, it was bound to happen. Something needed, someone needed to open their mouth and say it. And Obadiah Alliance, we did that. After, you know, I've been studying for about eight years the anthropology and history of the Igbos. And after that arduous investigation, I then decided to write this uh, Teshubah. And I shared it with my colleagues after finishing. And to my, you know, I was a, a bit nervous when I shared it with them because I wasn't, I wasn't sure how they would react to, to the notion of, of that we have Israelite brothers in Africa who are black and we have been disconnected from them for a long time. And, when, and to my surprise, two of the rabbis immediately unanimously said, this is excellent work. You know, Hashem bless you for what you have done. And, um, and then we, we got permission to uh, publish it. And it was published last year in January. After doing that, there was a huge boom on, on social media, on YouTube, even on Nigerian TV and other media uh, and avenues of, of information. And, um, and a lot of people started writing me every day. My, my email was full from Igbos all over the world saying, Rabbi, what do I need to do now? What can I do? What does this mean? Can I make Aliyah? Am I recognized in the local Jewish community? There were so many questions going around. And so, yeah, that's that's my answer to your... your yeah, no, 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 it's great. We're going in, in, a, in a perfect direction. So let me ask this, for the people who may not know, how, I mean, everyone's familiar with secular court, right? You know, people pay tickets, people have different issues. Right. But how does a rabbinical court go about, in this particular area of verifying someone's Judaism? How does that work? How do you guys come to that? Very good question. There are a number of, of Bate Din, Jewish tribunals around the world that do this. They usually issue what in Hebrew we call Shetar Berur Yahadut, which is a document which clarifies your Jewish status or identity. And so what most rabbis are trained to do is to look for documentation. They look for sometimes pictures or writings in prayer books or pictures of tombstones. They also listen to oral uh, stories and testimonies of witnesses about the Jewishness of a particular individual. So this, this is how most rabbis 
who handle these cases are trained. We, we go a step further because the rabbis of the Alliance have studies in anthropology and history and secular studies. What that means is that we're able to do what halachas requires in the Talmud tractate Hulin, page 12a, it says, wherever you can ascertain the facts, you must do so. And wherever you cannot, we incline to the majority. And what that means is before we can even make a ruling or before we can go to the halakha and, and, and make a decision, we have to first do the science. What the science means is anthropology. We have to do, we have to put on our thinking cap and put on, go on, go into the field and investigate genealogy, stories, documents, everything you can think of. And, and also looking at if, if it's, if it's regarding a particular group of people, then that enters into another category of law, which is, or another premise in the law, which is hazaka by the law of majority. And so when you have, when you have a group of people doing something, this is not one individual, but a group of people who are doing the same exact thing within a particular context. So in anthropology, you have, you do what's called the ethnography. The ethnography is you go into the fields, you immerse yourself, you include your experience in what you are observing, and then you step away, you step back. And when you step back at the second stage, you do what's called ethnology, which is interpreting what all of that means. And so a rabbi who does this type of work has to do this type of investigation first. That's what the rabbis are doing in the Talmud and tracted Abu Dazara. Someone, how did these Sanhedrin judges know how to rule what is considered illicit worship? They were anthropologists. They knew what the nations were doing and how they worshiped their deities and the type of rituals and practices that the nations practice within the Near Eastern context. And then they were able to rule for or against or create a fence to protect the ignorant people from falling into Abu Dazara by way of ignorance. So the, um, the way the court works is traditionally, you have a place where you meet with all the, the judges, the rabbis included to re answer questions. There are different things you do. In halakha, you can do what's called uh, berur, Berur uh, Din or Berur Halakha to explain a law. If there's a question about a law that's kind of gray, it's not black and white, and these questions are asked, are given to Dayanim, the Dayanim study the case, and then they, they issue a ruling in written form. So it's called responsum in the Latin term or English. In, halakha, in Hebrew, we call that Teshuba or shoot, she'elot to teshubot. Judges can also uh, rule in cases of monetary or civil matters, including uh, divorce, marriages, and business. To this day, many batedin do not deal with the civil matters because of the lack of political religious juris jurisdiction. There's only one country that really has that, which is Morocco today. The Dayanim there rule according to Jewish law in all matters because they have been given that authority. Not even in Israel, where we have a large number of Jews, is this the case? You have different legal systems that some most of the time do not jive with each other. And that's what creates the debate and the disputes that we have on a daily basis in that type of court. Because of the pandemic, I'm going to add something new. Because of the pandemic, many civil courts, secular courts, started to utilize the internet as a way to, as a way to uh, uh, hear cases and uh, through Zoom. And many Jewish tribunals assume the same exact methodology. And so what today many Batedin will do is the rabbis will meet by 
by way of video, a video call like we're doing now to talk about issues. And then they will discuss according to the law and by way of consensus. So you need an odd number. If you have five judges, you need a majority of five, which will be at least three. So in that case, when you have a, you have a majority, then that matter is established. As we learn from the, the Torah, that any matter is established by, by three. And also we incline to the majority as we learn in the Talmud. So that's, that's how Jewish courts uh, work today. Sometimes in some cases they function, they have civil authority and in other cases they don't. And so um, we see cases, for example, that have to do with the Aguna crisis, the divorce and all of that. Um, in some places like in New York, where you have a large amount of Jews, some, a bed din may stipulate on the marriage contract to tell those who are involved to delegate their authority in the case of divorce to the lawyers and judges that are on that bed din. And many of those rabbis will be practicing lawyers or even judges in secular court. And what that, what that means is they're able then to make the settlement out of court and then present it at the register at the civil court. So you have Jewish law then being interpreted into the local law of the land. And that's what we need more of today in the diaspora. That's what's lacking in order to fix this problem. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no, you, you're on fire. This is very good. Um, okay, so, okay, so with that being said, and now you know, for people just joining, you know, the Rob just gave us went through the structure of the international based in that. Um, all the questions that we have, just just hold off. We're gonna have a Q and A at the end. You could put the questions in now. Feel free to put the questions in now, and we'll address them uh, later on. So uh, for people just join. The Rob just went through the, the, you know, he gave us the outline on his background. This whole conversation, uh, this whole Zoom is recorded, so it'll be on YouTube. It's on live on YouTube now. It's going to be on all the different social media. We're going to cut up different parts, the whole thing. But the Rob just went through, uh, he gave us a back, you know, a, a, a brief overview of his very extensive, impressive background. And then we went into the international rabbinical court that he's the head of. And we just now touched on the point of how that rabbinical court works and how rabbinical courts work in general. And so um, before we go into uh, exactly the Igbo dynamic and, and what we came out of that, I want people to understand what is, what, what is the difference per, per se? We have Rabbi Chaim Konetsky in Blessed Memory um, who, who, who's, 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 you know, is no longer with us, but gave the ruling in 2014. Uh, we have other rabbis like Rabbi uh, Abadi Yosef, mm -hmm. you know, who gave a ruling on the Ethiopian Jews. Mm -hmm. So, how, for as, for as much as you know, you could share with us, how did they how did they see the issue, and then how and then how do you guys? This is the same, or is there different perspectives? Okay, very very good question. So, I will have to make a disclaimer first before even I uh, address the question for everyone to know that. Because most people don't know the, uh, how, in terms of jurisdiction, how does a Jewish court function? And most people think that if one bet din or one Jewish court makes a ruling, that that is binding for all Jews in the whole world. And I will have to say that's not the case. Today, because we lack a Sanhedrin, which is a national court in the Holy Land, what we have are various courts throughout the entire diaspora and each one of those courts can establish what are called takanot or gezerot uh, reparations to the law or ordinances which protect the negative mitzvot which are those commandments which are the don'ts don't do such and such thing and as the rambam explains in the introduction of mishneh torah one court cannot force another court to accept its rulings so, or from one country to another country, uh, one court cannot force the other to accept the ruling. And th this, is, this is basically the space 
in which we find ourselves today. So what happens is when a ruling is made by one court in one particular place, whoever has the best or the most media coverage will have the most uh, uh, acceptance around the world. That's one of the things that's happening today. With the power of the internet, when a ruling is, is, is made in a Jerusalem court, for example, uh, J-Post or Arush Sheva or one of the Israeli newspapers or the various Jewish newspapers around the world will cover those cases, publicize it, they'll put it on YouTube, they'll put it on Facebook, they'll put it everywhere, and people read, as they read this, wherever they live, including rabbis, they will then decide whether they want to respect that ruling or not. So that's, that's the space in which we find ourselves today. And that, that's, how it's, that's how it has been for the last 1500 years or so. And so um, that's the first thing that I, that I need to say about, um, about how, this, how this functions. Uh, what is the next, the next part of your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so with that point, now that we have that, Rabbi Chaim Kanetsky, he gave a ruling. Right. Um, there was a group of rabbis that were in communication with Igbo, some traveled, you know, right. different things happened, and they came back with their data. Mm -hmm. And people have to realize, Rabbi Chaim Kanetsky, when he passed away, there was over a million people came to his funeral. Right. He's one of the most right. respected rabbis in our generation. Mm -hmm. um, and as and as Rab Demote just said, the rabbinical rulings and what goes on with the state of Israel are two different things. And we're not really addressing immigration mm -hmm. issues or any of that. That's not the point of this discussion. But he came to a, a ruling based off of the data that was acquired by his rabbinum. And he gave a ruling. Now, the thing is, is that he he brought in the idea of reacclamation because that was really the, the, the issue. The issue isn't whether the Igbos were Jewish or not, or, mm -hmm. or Israelites, whatever term you want to use. The issue was how do they reacclimate, right? That's correct. That's correct. So I um, now, now I remember exactly how I wanted to address your question. So Previous, in previous rulings, like the one of Rabbi Kamnieski, the, the question was raised to him, um, we have these people in Nigeria called Igbos. They have this, they have that, they do this, they do that. Should we consider them Am Israel, Bene Israel? Should we consider them as Jews? And the rabbi said, if they have all that, yes, but they should do Giyur Lehumra. They should do giyur lehumra in order to be accepted within the Jewish nation. And, and most people don't know what that means. They don't know what that means, a giyur lehumra. A giyur lehumra is a legal mechanism which was invented or emerged, I would say, after the state of Israel was founded. So after the 1950s, in order to, in order to remedy or repair the question of doubts of the various Jews who were migrating to the state of Israel. If we look, if we do the legal anthropology or the legal history of the, this very same question of Jewishness, what we're going, if we look, I have written an article about it. In fact, uh, uh, between the Ash, a difference between the legal system among Ashkenazim and among Sephardim. And what we see is that the Ashkenazim in the 10th century or so, from the time of Rabbi Gershom of Mentz, Shalom, from that time in the, the first and the second crusades, there's a marked difference as to how the Rabbanim are treating the cases of those Jews who were estranged to the community because of Christianity. And so the question is, how do we deal with those who converted and now I want to come back. Those rabbis who lived before the first crusades unanimously say there are, they are Jews, they are our brothers. The fact that they became Christian doesn't make them non-Jewish. And if they want to come back, then they have a certain uh, procedure to do so. Uh, some of them say simply just reintegrate into community and renounce uh, the Abu Dazara. But then when we look at this very same literature among Ashkenazi rabbis, after the second crusades, what we start seeing is a number of opinions 
so many different opinions. And, and one of those opinions, which to this day, some rabbis are quoting in Israel, surprises me from the, fifth, from the 15th century, from the Maharam, Rabbi Meir of Rottenburg, Bavaria, he said that those Jews who convert to Christianity, even though it was by force, if they want to come back, they need to shave all the hair, like a baby, they need to share all, shave all the hair, and they need to receive flogging. They need to be flogged, and they need tebila. So you have three criteria there for return. And, you, and to this day, you will hear some rabbis who are quoting this very same Pesach Din from the 15th century from Rothenburg. And so what we see as we progress forward, this issue of Anusim, of Jews who are forced, who are coerced or under duress among the Ashkenazim in the context of the Soviet Union in Russia, we have... Um, or in the 19th century, we have Rabbi uh, the Petichet Teshubah, Rabbi Moshe Eisenstadt. And what he says is something very interesting. He says that those who have been estranged to the community and want to return, those rebels, Mumarim, he uses the term Mumar, that want to come back, they all they need is Tebila before three. They need Tebila, immer ritual immersion. And be, they can do this tabila on Shabbat. That's very interesting because normally a, an immersion that's done for the case of Giur cannot be done on the Shabbat. But he writes in his commentary, if you look on, on Petichet Shubah, the commentary Petichet Shubah in the Shuhan Aruch, which I have here behind me, on uh, the laws of Gerut. So that's in Yore Dea. Yuredea, I believe it's page 268, 269, the laws of conversion. And in his commentary, he says that they can do this on Shabbat because it's not a giyur. As we progress forward into the 20th century with the state of Israel, all of, all of these opinions become, I would use the term, amalgamated into a type of soup and what emerges is what's called giyur le humra. So giyur le humra, two terms, giyur, conversion, humra from the word strict. So we have a, a rule, we have a, a halachic principle which says, safek mi doraita le humra. Whenever you are faced with a doubt of a Torah miswa, a Torah precept, we must be act in this, we must take the strict approach or opinion. And so Giyun Lehumra is exactly that. It's okay, this person says he's Jewish or Israelite, but we don't have proof. We don't have the proof. Therefore, this person should do a Giyur and it should not be like a person who's trying to learn to be Jewish and take a, uh, uh, has to study for a long time, but this person should be received immediately and just do the Giyur out of doubt. Some people call it Giyur Mesafek. Others call it Giyur, uh, giyur Lehazara or Giyur of return. So all these terms are basically the same for the same exact principle. Now I've explained what, what goes on in the Ashkenazi, according to Ashkenazi jurisprudence. When we go to the Sephardic jurisprudence on the same exact matter, beginning with the Rambam in the 13th, 14th century, in his Igeret Hashemat and in the Mishneh Torah, Ilchot Mamerim, chapter 3, Halacha 3, he, he states those Jews, those Israelites who have been under duress, who have, were forced to convert to Islam, they are Jews. And if they want to come back, they can come back. There's no ritual process. There's, with the exception if they were not able to, the men were not able to undergo the circumcision, then they have to do that. But there's no notion of tebila at all. And mm -hmm. also he addresses the issue of the Karaites within in the Mishneh Torah, that is the context of this law. And he says that they are like Tinok Shenishba. They are like children who have been sequestered by the nations and have been indoctrinated in their practices and their customs. 
And then he says, if they come back, if they approach the Jewish community and they know that they are Jews, they shall be received. They are like anusim, he says. They are like ke anus. They are under duress. And that's that's a very interesting legal term because in the law it says, kol anus rahmana patre. Anyone, any Jew who is under duress, the merciful one exempts him. So that means that all of the all of those all of those judgments that the law requires to apply to a Jew or an Israelite that violates the laws like Shabbat, Kasherut, and many other things, that person, because of that situation of duress, is exempt. And of course, there are three exceptions. There are three exceptions to that. Uh, we learn uh, idolatry, murder, and uh, sexual morality. So the Rambam finish, uh, finishes saying, and we should not rush, we should not rush, speaking to the judges, we should not rush to go and seek their death. In other words, we should give life and instruct them and bring them to the wings of the Shekhinah. This ruling of the Rambam became the basis for all of the Sephardic Chachamim until this day. And what we see is a, continu a continu continuity of how rabbis, after the expulsion of Spain, whether they are in the lands of the Ottoman Empire or North Africa, uh, or whether they are in Western Europe, like in Italy or Amsterdam, they are all ruling in the same exact way. There are some nuances here or there, but they're all basing the Jewish identity of those Jews who are under duress on the notion of hazaka. So the notion of hazaka, that, that uh, legal premise or that legal principle is the way that all Jews can be considered Jews today. I remember one of, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Chacham Jacob de Oliveira, we had a long talk in 2008 before I moved to the Dominican Republic. And he said to me, Yohanan, all Jews today are Jews by Hazaka. And it, it, it didn't dawn on me at that time uh, exactly what, what he was saying until I started to travel around the world and started to deal with various cases and started to see that he had a very strong point. What that means is that there are practically no Jews today that can trace a lineage going all the way back to Mount Sinai or even to Ezra. So what that means is that Jews or those who claim to be Jews today are Jews because of the notion of legal presumption which in Hebrew is hazakah. And there are, various, there are various ways that hazakot, in the plural, are established. There's the law of majority, there's a law of, of um, a portion that is extracted from another one. There are many principles. I made podcasts about this, 10 different podcasts on how to establish different types of hazakah. And just to put it to you, to bring it close to us, Many Jews uh, today descend from Holocaust survivors. And those Jews who perished, those that survived and were able to escape to the lands of North and South America, when they arrived to the new places, they came with no documents, no witnesses. Uh, they came with nothing just with the clothes they have on their backs and their shoes. And in some cases, they even changed their surnames to be able to hide the Jewish identity. They changed the names. And so the question is, how can, the pers how can this person and their grandchildren, their children and grandchildren, how can they claim to be Jews within a new context, having no witnesses, having no documents, having nothing? And the answer is, is very simple, hazaka. So what do the rabbis do in those cases? They would, when that person approaches the local rabbi, the rabbi will say, tell me, what's your name? Oh, my name is so-and-so. Oh, I'm from this, where my parents and grandparents were from such and such place. They were part of this community. And if the rabbi then wants to investigate more, the rabbi will then ask and say, tell me, what, does your, what did you see your mother and grandmother do on Fridays before sunset? And we all know 
the practice is to hadlakat ner shel shabbat. And so all of these, what we call modus operandi, the way of acting, are the hazaka for the individual to prove his or her Jewishness before a court. So in the Talmud, in Tract Hulin, chapter, I call Shohatin, which is the first chapter, we have a principle. We see it clearly in the laws of Shahita. It says if you see some, if you see an Israelite, an Israelite performing Shahita, we don't doubt that that person knows what he or she is doing. We give them the legal presumption that they are experts. So we do not bring the doubts first. This principle, this legal principle of hazaka, of legal presumption that's given to a shochet, the Sephardic Chachamim utilized this principle in determining Jewish identity of those Jews who have been estranged for centuries from the Jewish, the mainstream Jewish communities in the Ottoman Empire or even in, in, in Western Europe. We see it in various responsa of the Chachamim of Salonika, of, of, of the responsa in Peri Haim in Amsterdam, and the responsa in Italy by, by the Chachamim like, uh, from Padua, like Leon de Moderna and others. They are utilizing these legal uh, principles to establish the Jewish identity or Israelite identity of those who have been cut off for a long time. And they are still Jews if they have that legal presumption. And so this legal presumption can be utilized today for various, not only for individuals who have been, because the, in the term, in the case of one individual, the individual comes from a majority. If we can establish that one person came from a, a particular condition which expresses or which um, represents the majority in another place, and we can prove that connection, then we can also establish the hazaka of this person based on this hazaka. In the same way, the Chachamim used the language of the flower. You take a piece of the flower from, like when we take out the hala or the teruma, you take that little portion away from the big batch. This same exact imagery is utilized to establish this halachic principle of, of farish, min ruba farish, a portion that is extracted from a heterogeneous portion is representative of that majority. I know I'm saying a lot here, but well, it's very important uh, for people to understand how this functions. Because a lot, of people don't, a lot of people don't know how or why they are Jews. A lot of people think if you have a piece of paper, that is your Jewishness. But if that piece of paper gets burnt or destroyed, you don't have those witnesses. So how, how do you prove Jewishness? How do you do it? All you have is the way you live, what you do, your actions, your testimony. And if you have people who know of you as living as a Jew, you have witnesses. But if those witnesses also perish, then you, you and you have no documentation and you have and uh, and you're in a place where you you're not able to tap into your hazaka, your community of witnesses, then you are cut off. So how do you reintegrate? And this is and this is this is my expertise in the law. So yeah, this is this is like extremely important, extremely educational, because like you're saying, you know, today, especially you know, with the state of Israel growing, Brook Hashem and the Jewish community and social technology, all these different factors that are here, you know, there's people that are emerging all over the world. There's people right. throughout Africa, people in India, people in certain European countries, different places around the world that say the Middle East, you know, hey, we have Jewish lineage, you know, we, right. we have these backgrounds. So what you're giving us is, is an outlook, you know, to, to kind of like when we hear these claims and not necessarily reject them, you know? Right. I would say something else too. We, um, I spoke first about the Ashkenazi legal system, and it's not, uh, it's not. There's no continuation. There are many differences, 
But just I will mention one rabbi that's very Ashkenazi rabbi that's very close to us that many will probably know the name. The Hazonish was Rabbi mm -hmm. Karabitz. The Hazonish wrote in one of his responsum about Kohanim. And the question was, how, how do we know? How do we know today that the, those who claim to be Kohanim are actually Kohanim and that they are Kesharim? And what he says there is, is astounding. And I used I used his his uh his halakha, his ruling for the ruling on the Ebos. And that's how I ended. I, I call that the knockout punch. And I'm going to tell you why. Because what he says there is no Kohen, no one today claiming to be a Kohen can trace his lineage all the way back to Ezra HaKohen. But we presume, we presume that that person and that family are actual Kohanim because of their performance. And we do not raise the doubt that perhaps one of, they married a woman that we're not supposed to. We know from the Torah, Perashat Emor, that a Kohen who marries a, a Zona Gerusha Halala, the children are not apt to be Kohanim. They're, called, they're considered Halalim, Kohanim Halalim. And so the Hazoni says, we don't, we don't presume for the negative. We presume for the positive. Why? Because there's hazaka. And what, how is the hazaka established? For Kohanim, there are two types of hazaka. There's a Kohen who has hazaka of genealogy, and there's a Kohen who has hazaka of performance in the community. So we have a Kohen who blesses the congregation on all the services and reads the Torah first and says and gives and receives the honor to say Birkat Hamazon. This is a Kohen who has the hazaka of synagogue performance. And then you have a Kohen by genealogy. This type of Kohen is one, according to the Halakha, is a Kohen who has witnesses for three generations, father and grandfather, who served in the Bet HaMikdash. You know what that means? Today, we have no Kohanim with this kind of Hazaka because we haven't had the Bet HaMikdash for almost 2,000 years. So all Kohanim today are only Kohanim based on the second level of Hazaka which is at the synagogue level. And it should be of no surprise to us that when in 2008, uh, Dr. Doron Behar performed a genetic test on Kohanim at the Kotel, the Western Wall in Jerusalem, uh, only about 60% had descended from the same father. Another, the other 40% had different paternal uh, uh, lineages. What that means is that there are various lineages of Kohanim or people claiming to be Kohanim who do not descend from the same ancestor or the same paternal ancestor, which we presume to be Aharon or Ezra. So, so for you to see how Hazaka functions, what are the limitations to Hazaka? Hazaka is not, is not a way to prove 100%. Law, the Jewish law doesn't work that way. Jewish, Jewish law works with legal presumption. That's, that's what I can say about that. So in other words, if, if and that's why the Rambam says in the Mishneh Torah, if you see, is, he's, he says, and this is based on tractate Kiddushin, chapter four, where it says, kol, kol, mishpahot, kol, mish, kol mishpahot Israel yesh lahem kasherut lehitaden ze baze. All Israelite families, have are fit to marry one with the other. They have the legal presumption to marry one with the other. However, however, if you see one family or a specific family speaking la shonhara or creating problems in the community, then we put that family in doubt and we must investigate them. So the law works. The law doesn't assume that you have to prove who you are. It gives you the legal presumption that you are who you say you are unto proven guilty. Does that sound familiar in American law? You are innocent unto proven guilty. That's how Jewish law works. In other places, no. They say, no, you need to prove that you are first. So Jewish law doesn't work that way. If it worked that way, the whole Jewish nation would be in trouble today because we don't have genealogies going all the way back to the time of period of the covenant. I hope that's clear. 
Yeah, and you know, and it's and it's tough, you know, for maybe for some people to really take in that thing because, you know, like when the person's in a community and and they see like a person convert to Judaism, generally, generally they see like a very like stark approach where the the convert has to do this and do that, this was this, this. So then at the end, the convert converts and and, and they have their certificate, whatever. So I think that experience maybe reinforces to people in their community about their Jewish authenticity. Because if this person, go ahead, Rob. Yes, you, you're right. You're bringing up a very good point. But you know what happens in a lot of cases? If that person, if that Jew with that certificate goes to another community where they don't recognize that bed din, they'll yep. say, no, we don't accept you. So there, the hazaka that that person has in one place doesn't apply in another. And these, these are issues that are happening every day that we have to deal with on a daily basis. So when it comes to the Igbo Jews specifically, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were your conclusions and what was your methodology to get to your conclusion? All right, conclusions and methodology. So I explained earlier, for those who came late, uh, we have to do the anthropology and history first. Jewish law requires us to do investigations first before interpreting the law and then finally applying the law. So in anthropology, we have a methodology which is ethnography and ethnology and perhaps even sociology. These are three methods that anyone who studies anthropology will learn. You immerse yourself in the culture, you study it, you observe it, and then, and you take notes and you write about it, what you observed and you include yourself in it. That's ethnography. Then the ethnology then is the interpretation of what those things mean, the meaning of, of those things you observed and also participated in. When you do the ethnology, that's where the halakha comes in. You bring all the, the laws which can apply to the, the anthropology that you did. And then finally comes the conclusion. What it, in the, the interpretation of, of the anthropology and the law in the language of the rabbis, because Teshubotes uh, responsum are written for in rabbinic language for rabbis, not for the lay people. So in the, in the case, when it comes to the Igbos, after eight years of studying, of looking at the anthropology, they have, First, I must say that various books that have been written, many books on anthropology of Igbos, history books as well. You can look in the, work, the books of Remy Ilona. You can look at the books of Vasden, the books of Daniel Lees. Um, you can look at books of, of Jean Bicent, uh, who is a Haitian anthropologist. Uh, you can look at the works of... Um, uh, the book called The Forgotten Diaspora, The Making of the Jewish Atlantic. This very important book published in 2014 by J Jose Horta da Silva and, P and Mark Peter. There are many, there has, there's a lot of scholarship written about the Igbos. What, has, what was not done until Oba the Alliance was interpreting all of that, doing the ethnology, and then the halakha, and putting it together and saying, hey, this is what we have. That's what has not been done. And that's what we did. Now, with that said, why, a lot of people ask me, why did I go to Nigeria? Did I go to Nigeria to, to confirm what the ruling that was established a year ago? And I would say, no, I didn't go to confirm that. I went, I went to go see the condition of my brothers because I'm not the first, nor will I be the last to acknowledge that the Igbos are brothers of the Jewish people. In the 17th century, the chief rab two chief rabbis of London, uh, Rafael Mandola and also uh, Shalomon Svi Hirsch addressed letters to the Igbos saying, and they begin their letters saying, Ahenu Bene Israel, our brothers, children of Israel. And so, as uh, from that time period, we see already how Jews are interacting, or rabbis, I would say, interacting with the with the Igbos and addressing them as brothers. 
this is, should not surprise us, but many people don't know. So I went, I went to Nigeria to see what our brothers are doing, how they are living, what is the condition, what are their needs, what type of, uh, what do they have? What do they lack? These were the questions I had. And one of the things I did, and I spent a month there, and every day, pretty much every day, I interviewed elders, Igbo elders, and I wanted to acquire what in Igbo language is omenana or omenala, what you do in the land. I wanted to record interviews of elders, Igbo elders, not for my sake, not for their sake, but for the sake of, of people like you who are listening today, to listen to listen to their oral traditions of their practices and, and, and for the people to, to bring it into the language of, of the laity. Because most people are not gonna be able, knowledgeable enough to read a Teshubah in Hebrew, in rabbinic Hebrew. It's, it's quite complex to follow the legal reasoning. But listening to a podcast in English, well, Nigerian English at that, will be much easier, more accessible to people listening. And so that's what I did. I went, I went to four cities. I started in Abuja, then Lagos, and then uh, Oweri. And uh, I visited various congregations of Igbos who have been Judaized. And I'll explain what that means. In Igbo history, the Igbo tradition is an entirely oral tradition. It's an entirely oral tradition, meaning that they didn't transmit their Torah by way of, of writing in a book like Jews did. They transmitted it orally. And one of the things that really amazed me was to what extent oral the oral tradition was transmitted and kept among Igbo. And I will say this, one of the things that mostly surprised that most surprised me was to see Igbos practicing, no matter if they are uh, uh, practicing Judaism or connected to Judaism or not, they will circumcise all the boys on the eighth day. They will marry among themselves. They don't marry outside and they have to perform marriage according to their marriage ritual, which parallels with Jewish Israelite marriage rituals. And they practice some things that we read in the Torah every, every year in Bereshit and Shemot, and, but we don't practice in our Jewish communities to this day. And that's because of diaspora. Every time the Jewish people have suffered some type of persecution or ter political turmoil, they have had to move from one country to the next. And every time we move from one place to the next, we lose, a, we lose a bit of our soul. We lose a little bit more of our tradition. But the Igbos have been for millennia, if not many centuries, in one particular region, peacefully. They were able to preserve their oral tradition without problems until about 150 years ago. That's when the uh, Christianity came in to this country, to this region of Iboland. And that's where, that's, that's what's going on here is forced conversions to Christianity. The Anglican church, the British came in and brought the Anglican church and told the, the parents, uh, we, we will educate your children for free. Yeah, they educated them in the church and in Christianity. They learned to read and write but they estranged them from, from the Torah. And so what happened was as the, that second generation of children, they were estranged from the, the oral traditions of the Igbos and created a, a problem within the family such that the children were raised thinking that everything they learn or do, or do in the land in the form of omenana or omenala is considered or is rather to be pagan, paganism. So now as Christians with this the theology, they want to, they want to be, go as far as way as possible from those traditions. And that's the context 
of the responsum that the Obadiah Alliance uh, ruled on. Not to say that they are Jews or not Jews, but to say those who have been estranged, how are they to come back? And there's something that's very different on this ruling from many other rulings. The ruling didn't say, did, doesn't say that a Jewish court should receive or should determine uh, that, that the Jewish court should determine uh, whether Igbos are Jews or not or apt to return into a community. And rather, they should go to the Igbo communities and perform the colonial ceremony because they have their own procedure to return and receive those who have been estranged from Omenana, Omenala. They have their own procedure. And, and I don't believe that the Jewish community, first of all, most rabbis don't know anything about Igbos. So that, that renders them, that disqualifies them from even making any type of ruling. The Igbos know themselves, their chiefs, tribal leaders, they know exactly who is who. I remember when, <laughs> when I went to uh, the first community in Abuja, people were looking at me funny because they said, you look like us, kind of, but mm, are you Igbo? Are you from us? Who are you? Where are you from? I, in one of the communities uh, I visited in Lagos, one of the gentlemen said to me, Rabbi, we have heard everything you have said to us, but you know who we are, but who are you? I had to give him my genealogy. And after I gave him six generations on both sides of my, uh, my, my tree, he was satisfied. He was satisfied. And so <laughs> this, I'm just telling you how, how they function. So most Jews will not be able to, to, to pass that test within this community because the Igbos are connected to the land. They are connected to their ancestral land. Wherever Igbos pass away, they must be buried in the land of their ancestor. So they know who they are. They can trace many generations back because they have inherited, they have lands which are passed down from generation to generation within that same family in the same way we see in the Torah, the law of inheritance, Nahalah. And Jewish communities don't practice this today, but they practice that still to this day because they are in their land. They have their land. And Jews have been displaced from country to country, land to land for many generations. And these types of practices that have to do with the land have become theoretical for us to this day. But for them, it's, it's something they, they live on a daily basis, on a daily basis. So um, from an anthropological standpoint, what was one of the most shocking or insp inspiring parts of your trip over to Nigeria? Oof, there's a long list. And you know, I, I, I started to write down some of them, my thoughts, because if not, we're not finished. <laughs> I will never end this uh, interview. Um, there are a lot of things. I, I, I want to share with everyone that I, I, I kind of posted, I made a funny post on my Facebook account uh, at, after the first, my first um, Shabbat experience in Abuja. And I said to my fellow Jews, if you have not worshiped with Igbos before, you have not been worshiping properly. <laughs> that's, that's what I said. And people were like, what? What are you talking about? What is this? What's going on? And what I want to say with that is that I, I cried with tears of joy. At this, at this synagogue, the first synagogue I went to. When I, I, I stepped in and I sat down, grabbed my talets and my beracha, and grabbed my, my, my sidur, and then the prayers, everything was in Hebrew. So that was my first shock. I said, wow, everything is in Hebrew here. Okay, that's nice. And perfect pronunciation, very clear and crisp pronunciation. And then the whole service, I was called up to read the, the, the Torah, the first reading in the place of Kohen, because they didn't have a Kohen. And then after the Torah service, then as they return the Torah to the ark, most congregations are singing and chanting Mizmor Le David, Psalm 29. They have a special melody in Igbo language that they sing. And 
I never in my life, I had never experienced something so powerful and meaningful in, in a Jew, within a Jewish space ever. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm 42 years old. I've been to a lot of Jews. I've never, ever experienced such, such uh, atmosphere in any Jewish congregation in the world. That was my introduction into uh, Igbo Jewish uh, practice. Then when I went to uh, Lagos, similar experience, joy, hospitality, and the Alenu. If you, if you haven't experienced Alenu, which is the last prayer, the last de declaration of the prayer service, with the Igbos, you have not been praying it properly. They know how to do it. And wow. it's, it's such, it's from the beginning to the end, it is joyful. It's filled with kawana. And we know what that is. The halakha says we must pray with intent. It cannot be done in a mechanic way. Many times I will go into a synagogue and people are just mumbling the lips, just trying to get through the, the book, get through the prayers, and then they're done and, and just leave. Sometimes they're, they're, they're mumbling and not even looking into what they're saying. It's done by rote. But the Igbo congregations, you won't see that. Everybody is involved. There's call response going on. There's call response going on the entire time. And, um, and just beautiful melodies between Hebrew, English, and Igbo language. Um, something that I experienced in Oweri, when I went to Igbo land, was something that I had never experienced in any Jewish congregation either. The, uh, many Jews don't know what bak bakashot are. Bakashot, if you open like an old Sephardic prayer book, bakashot are those supplicatory prayers or songs like hymns, which are said before the morning prayers. So it's a way of you entering into a mode of meditative mode and opening your heart to then begin the actual study, uh, the Korbanot and, and the Pesuket Zimra, and then the Amida. In Oweri, they begin every morning their prayers with 40 minutes, 40 minutes to an hour of bakashot, of just praising and singing in English and Hebrew and Igbo language. And on the days that are not Shabbat and Yom Tov, they use traditional instruments, percussive instruments to, to uh, enhance the, the service. And I, I was able to experience that with them on Rosh Chodesh Ab, which was just a few weeks ago. And it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. And, and I, I just kept thinking to myself, why can't all Jews experience something like this? And I'm sure once you experience that, you, you can't go back. You can't go back to what you've been doing before. There's no way. That's why I like what you said, Rabbi. It's a life-changing experience. It has been a life-changing experience for me. Amen. Definitely. For sure. Um, uh, the food is very hot and spicy, but it's fresh and tasty. The weather is very hot. There's sunshine every day, some rain here or there in the summer, in the July, but it's very hot there, very close to the equator. And that's, that's actually a benefit for, for, for prayers because like the, here in Europe where I live, Shabbat can end at 11 p.m. at night, but, but in somewhere close to the equator, it's the same the whole year, between six and 7 p.m. the whole year. And that's more in line with what the halakha establishes for prayer. You know, when you have these long solar hours, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, it spoke about how hospital they are and the singing and the music. And I just, I had, I had many tears of joy, many tears of joy. Yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, this is like we, we're all we all a part of the journey now that you've um, established in these things. Now, in terms of like tefillah prayers, these types of things, these were these things that just organically happen over time. 
Good question. So it's, you know, it's different in all the congregations I've visited. Most, the, most have learned, they have learned either online with what we have through YouTube or other um, pages that record the liturgy. They have taught themselves. They have acquired books by rabbis who have visited either from Israel, Cam excuse me, Cameroon, or from the United States. Uh, whatever literature they have in their hands has come to them from the outside. And mm. they have learned, they have learned, they have been guided either in Ashkenazi tradition, some of them in Sephardic tradition, um, I would say more Yerushalmi, some even Moroccan, which makes more sense because genetically speaking, a lot of Igbos descend from, Mor have connections with Moroccans. Um, and that, that's why this red cap comes from, this red fez comes from, that was explained, it comes from there. That's why the Igbos use the red. Uh, so um, you will not find a uniform Igbo Jewish prayer or liturgy. That doesn't exist. And that's something that, that uh, perhaps we can help them to create, but it has to stay indigenous. It cannot be a colonial invasion, like either creating something Ashkenazi or Sephardi for, for Igbos. They have to be able to create. And I think they're on the right track. They're on the right track. They just need some guidance. And um, what's going to happen, let me tell you, is that more every day, more and more Igbos are leaving Christianity and coming to the Torah. Wow. They're coming to the Torah. And so there's a lot of work, a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of space for us to help. But we cannot encroach on their traditions. It's for me, it felt like I went there to observe. And in some place, sometimes I was, I was, sometimes I was teaching and other times I was learning. So it, it was an interesting experience for me because as I, I learned Omenana, Omenala, and I'm teaching Sephardic Minhagim and, and tradition, legal tradition, everybody's learning and teaching at the same time. It was awesome. It was an awesome experience. So maybe maybe you could go more into it. I mean, we've I've had conversations with Remy alone mm -hmm. and other people. The, can we learn more about? Uh, hopefully, I'm thinking around Amunana because it sounds like Imu, Amuna. Sounds like Hebrew. Amuna. Yeah, Omenala yeah. means what you do in the land. There are different dialects of the language. Some people say Omenana, others say Omena Allah. So Allah means means the land. So what you do in the land. And the reason why it's this, the land is so important is because as we read in the Torah, we just read it last week in, in Perasha um, uh, Ekeb. I give you these mishpatim. I'm giving you these civil laws, which you shall do in the land. So mm -hmm. the name we call, we call Judaism in Hebrew, we call it the Mesor, we call it Mesora, the transmission. They call it Omenala or Omenana, which means what you do in the land. And you cannot separate evils from that land. You cannot, you cannot separate evils from the land because everything that they do depends on that land. There are, there are two, there are two uh, or there's a concept in evil culture called Aru. And Aru refers to, in Hebrew, what we call Toreba, which are abominations. Any type of Aru, that is committed in Igbo land, impurifies the land. We've seen that in the Torah. The Torah says, if you don't keep this misvot, the land will spit you out. It will vomit you out. They have the same exact concept in Omenana. And that's why when, when certain things happen within Igbo land, they have, to go to, they have to go through a ritual purification with their priestly clan, the Enri clan, to perform certain rituals. And if people don't want to uh, do Teshuvah and continue in their wayward um, uh, path, then they will be considered outcasts. No one will marry those people. And everybody knows who the outcasts because they're labeled as Osu, which are outcasts. No one will marry those lineages. That's something very important uh, 
that uh, I will mention later as we get into the question about slavery and slave trade, mm -hmm. because yes, we have the Igbos and the traditions, but among in their in their communities, they know, they know, they know who are the outcasts, and they don't marry those families. In the same way, in Jewish law, we don't marry the mamzerim. We don't marry those lineages. So they have the same exact concepts. Well, and, and so, um, so uh, no, I'm, I don't know, the, the law of the land of Munana, mm -hmm. um, saying it in you know, my dialect, um, mm -hmm. is, would that be like considered like um, a nusak? Was it a hashkafa? Is it like, like I know it's the law, but like, like how would we categorize it? To, to understand and is it something it's that everything it encompasses everything it encompasses what we will, what we will call halakha hashkafa mm -hmm. minhagim everything all of that all of that and, and, and is that a byproduct of i'm a, i'm i'm uh, it's two ideas with the one we, you talked about the judification yes right? so i want to touch on that but Amunana, this idea is this is this kind of like like kind of like their um their 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 masur that came from uh, Israel directly? Like yes, I will call it is their Mishnah. Okay, their Mishnah. Okay. Is their Mishnah? Is their Mishnah and also with I will say is their Talmud because the Talmud has halakha and it has Hagada and also also Midrash. So mm. in this case with them. Because it's not a written tradition, they don't have midrashim, but they have agadot. They have many stories, and those mm -hmm. stories teach the um, the wisdom, the morality, in the same way that agada does in the Talmud for the Jewish tradition. And then you have all the mishnayot, all the laws. All these laws in the Omenana is transmitted orally, because they well, are living it on a daily basis. What they do in the land. It's alive for them. It's not written. It's something they do daily from mm -hmm. the moment they wake up until they go to sleep. You know, one of the things um, about uh, the Beta Israel in the east of Africa, mm -hmm. when they went out there, the idea was to say that, okay, well, they had a, their system was revolved around like kind of like wise men, like they called them quiches or something like this, the, 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 the wise men of, so they the were, the, yes, the Kess. Yeah, they were the ones who were the trans. <laughs> Rabbi Kish is there, so I just you know saw his name. But um, the transmission of of that wisdom came through those elders. Is that the same structure that you see in um, Nigeria? Yes, and I saw something that I, I loved very much when I went to um, the first the first congregation I visited in Abuja. After the entire Torah service in the Jewish way, as as you know, the way we all Jews are doing it every Shabbat, then they move, they go to another room in the synagogue building, they go to another room and all the elders are sitting at the table and the youth are across from them. And then they do, every, they do omenana. They, they transmit all the oral teachings, what they have received from their elders, they transmit then to the next generation um, in a session that can last hours. Hours, mm. hours of transmission. So they are doing this every Shabbat. First, the Jewish rituals, and then Omenana. So that way they are preserving. They are preserving this way of transmitting from one generation to the next. I, I thought that was beautiful because in many congregations, Jewish congregations, you don't, you don't see you don't this type of transmission Maybe within the Syrian Jewish community, uh, there's this type of transmission speaking about the old country, which is Syria. Some people will speak in Arabic, and the elders are speak the elders are speaking in Arabic and talking about stories and and uh, and and lore coming from Syria and how it came into the local community, whether it's in Mexico, Argentina, or New York. You will see that in that kind of community, but many Jewish communities don't have that anymore. Uh, people are transmitting from books, not from their own experience or from what they heard from their grandparents. It's very different. 
And I thought that was, for me, that's one of the most powerful, one of the most powerful things that Igbo Jews are doing to this day. So in other words, even though they're, they are assuming Jewish practices that all Jews are doing around the world, they're not forgetting who they are as Igbos. And, and I think that's very powerful. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's needed, and in, in some people criticize uh, the Ethiopian expansion here in Israel and say that, you know, because they left a lot of their traditions and assumed, say, Ashkenaz or Sephardic ways, that it, that next generation that came after them just kind of left a lot of the religion and, and assimilated into just mainstream secular Israeli culture. That's correct. And that's, that's something that, that Igbo Jews, we can learn from Igbo Jews. They, they are living this experience every day. The, after, you know, Igbos every morning, they will, part, they will partake of the Kolonat ceremony. That is, that is one of the most important rituals that are practiced on a daily basis. So what are the what are the the issues? I'm just keep bouncing back with Beta Israel being you know very mm -hmm. accepted uh, Jewish community in Africa. One of the issues over there was the process of marriage, right? In in that dynamic. So like most of what we understand through marriage, we get out of the Masechet Kedushin and the first yeah you know, the first parak, you know these things, Kesef Starbia, and then we have Gitten, which is another Masechet that deals with the different variations around divorce. So them not necessarily having those Mishnayot per se, they do now, but just mm -hmm. historically they, they had their own, you know, Amunina in, in very yeah. ways. The question is, is how do they deal with those particular issues? Because in Ethiopia is kind of a, a balagan in certain areas. Okay. So among the Igbo is very organized and it's very globalized or universalized. I, in all of the communities I visited, I asked those questions and everyone gave me the same exact answers. So I was, I was, I was, and I recorded this in the podcast that I uploaded on, on my uh, SoundCloud and I shared it on my, on my Facebook pages for everyone to listen to them on a daily basis as I recorded them. What, um, what, uh, Uh, with four marriage takes place with four a uh, four four stages so when someone's going to get married they have to you know meet the parents the families meet there's an exchange of like a bride price so this is in jewish law it's called kinyan you know you can have a marriage without kinyan because yeah. of the language of the torah so they have kinyan in this sense what they don't have is a written ketubah but we know in Jewish law, the Ketubah was instituted by Rabbi Shimon ben Shattach during the Greek, the, Greek, the Greek period. So that's much later. So what they have in Omanana is something that's before this. Mm -hmm. So that go, that, that, that's one of the indications for me that this community broke off from the rest of, of, of Israelites before that time period mm -hmm. because of their, the way they do things. Um, in terms of divorce, there's practically, there's virtually no divorce among Igbos. But when there are divorces, it's, it has to, it's a communal thing. They have to come before the elders, before the families, and they try to convince them not to. And in some cases, some people are going to laugh. In some cases, a man will take another wife. And if he takes, when he takes a second wife, the first wife will stop acting up. So they, they, there were a lot of stories about that. Uh, there were a lot of stories about that <laughs> among, among the men. They were laughing a lot about it. Um, wait, wait, wait. This, I have this, it recorded as well on one of the podcasts. So things, I, think, when it's part of the ways to fix marital issues was through polygamy, in essence. Yes, yes. Because, wow. that, because then, according to what I was explaining, was that the first wife, if she was acting up, then she now enters into competition. So now she has to, she has to behave if she wants to keep that husband. So she has to behave. And, and yeah. that's, that's something that they, that they practice uh, in their communities. Uh, so. 
it, it, you know, it, it works for them. It works. It, it works. works for them. That's the culture. The culture. And, and okay, so just to move the conversation into like, so, you know, I brought Remy's name up before. Um, yes. He's written a lot of books about it. He's an expert on his area. God willing, we'll be able to have a conversation with him as well about this. All right. This is happening. Now, one of the things is, is that there's many historians that talk about, there's a famous African king. It's named Muhammad Bello. Have you read a, a book? Yes, yes. And he, and he writes in his memoirs that the Africans, he says, he's like defending the Africans, or he says, us Africans, we're not savages. We didn't sell our brothers into slavery. Rather, we sold the Canaanites. He referred to them as Canaanites, who have been living in our land for over a millennium. So that, as a point, many discussions around this topic, one of the most biggest and you say juiciest concepts is this idea that many Igbos were sold in the transatlantic slave trade. Now, some That's historians correct. say that there's 1.7 out of 1.7, there was 1.2, 1.3, some say less, you know, there's different, I guess she says she told to run the whole conversation. What did you get from the ground from the people there? Good question. So uh, I got from, so I spoke to some people who are descend from what they call Aru, the Aru men. And they explained to me that most of those slaves who were sold were from the Aru people, which are, is a group among the Igbos. The second thing they said to me was that in the first generation, they were trading just doing different types of trade with the Europeans. And then they were duped. They were taken as slaves uh, by the Europeans. And then it, then the, then the system was developed where the Aru were the ones doing the slave trading with the Europeans, the Aru, among the Igbos. And so the reason why there's a lot of controversy around this is because Everybody, everyone speaks about the Aru being responsible for the slave trades. But if you are from that group, you don't want to acknowledge your fault, the fault of your ancestors. So that's why there's this debate. Some are saying yes, and others are saying, no, it's not that, it's not this, because there's this pushback. It's uh, this, the blame, no one wants to take the blame. I was just speaking today, I speak on a daily basis with Omanana Defenders. Uh, we have a group for many years now. And, um, and we were talking about this very same issue today, this afternoon, before this uh, interview, and how this one particular group of Igbo say, the Aru need to ask for forgiveness for what they did by selling off so many slaves. Um, I'm not going to get into that debate. I'm just transmitting the information that I received. Yeah. Yeah. So on that point, you know, in North America, you know, going off of how halakhic rulings and decisions come about, over 100 plus years in America, there has been, you know, Blacks, African Americans, Negroes, whatever term you want to use, that have said, hey, we... Our tradition is that we're part of these lost tribes. They develop when they're able to have a religious freedoms, because there was a time where Blacks were not allowed to have religious freedoms. They, when they were able to, that's the first thing that they, they went to, right? And over 100 plus years, there's been Hebrew Israelites. We have a new radical expression of that today yes. that kind of like messes up the history. But the history has always been African Americans wanting Rabbi Matthews, Rabbi Levy, Rabbi Ford, you know, their their goal was always to try to integrate. They were rejected a lot, but <clears throat> which I think, which I believe led to this radical expression that we have today. What would we say to African Americans who identify or connect to this idea of the lost tribes based off of what we know today about the Igbos being sold into North America? Well, you know, I asked this very same question to the, the chiefs in, in Oweri, in Iboland. And the answer, the answer I got was this. The answer was, they, say, they said that they know how to identify Igbos 
no matter how many generations or where they have gone because of the practices they have. Mm. So I love the answer because that's the same exact answer we get in our Mishnah, in our Gemara, which is modus operandi. What you do, what you observe someone is doing, that, that is the testimony of that person's Israelite status. So uh, I was told that if someone claims to be Igbo or descendant of Igbo, we check to see what in their family, what customs do they have? If they have Igbo customs, they are Igbo. And then that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, how do we reintegrate them? Or what shall we do? How do we help them? And in Oweri, in Igbo land, they said, they told me that there have been people from Cuba and the USA who have done just that. They have come and integrated with them and have returned and have acquired their Igbo Jewish status in such mm. a way. So they are, they are prepared. I, I am now speaking for this community mm. and they, they are prepared to receive as many people as possible. Whoever wants to go and go through this, this experience of returning to your ancestor, to your roots, your cultural root, welcome. Okay, and so on that point, that's very, very important information that they're, they're, they're welcoming us. So another question is, the people who came to North America were under the context of distress, right? And, yeah. and for generations, they were forbidden to practice any other type of spirituality other than you know, what they received on plantations in many cases. Right. A lot of it was Christianity. Right. So how would they, from a halakhic standpoint, be classified dealing with that? But like, it's, like, it's like if someone was captured by the Romans or captured right. by a Spanish army and they were denied, mm -hmm. they said, hey, if you do any of this, boom, we're going to kill you. And then two, two, three generations, it's like, hey, we know we have an oral tradition that we have this connection. But in terms of practice, we, we really don't, um, we weren't allowed to keep anything based off of distress. Yes, this is a very difficult question to answer. And I believe it's difficult to establish a, a blanket statement for all cases. I believe it has to be studied case by case because I know, I know some African-Americans who can trace back to the port, the, the colony of Virginia. And in the colony of Virginia, almost 90% of the slaves that came in yeah. there were from the Ebola. Yeah. So if, if someone is able to trace by genealogy to those uh, slaves that came in and also trace that they were marrying Igbo, among Igbos, because that's another thing. Igbos don't marry outside of their culture. We see it in, in, in the Caribbean islands, uh, in Haiti, for example, the slaves there who were from the Igbo didn't want to mix with the other African slaves. They didn't mix because they were not circumcised. That's according mm. to historical documentation in that context. But in the context of the United States, we have to, we have to, before we can even tackle the halachic ramifications of this, I believe we need to do the anthropology and the history first. I yeah. haven't done that. I'm not an expert in that. So I, we learn from our teachers to say, when you don't know something, say you don't know. So I, I, I'm not an expert when it comes to yeah. the, the, this, what's happening in the United States. I know the Caribbean very well. I know those sources because I've studied them for my PhD and my master's and in what's happening in Brazil as well and in, in Suriname and these places. For example, so, there were yeah. cases where there were cases where Jews, Portuguese Jews bought slaves and they, and they were circumcised. They saw they were circumcised and they wrote letters back to the rabbis in Amsterdam. And they said, how should we treat them? They came from, you know, the Igbos and they said, free them. They are our brothers. We have those cases, we have those documents of the correspondences through the Shailot, the Shulot, the, the Shoot literature or the responsive literature. But, but these, this is what's happening in Brazil and in Suriname, uh, South America, 17th, 18th century. 
but I haven't seen anything like that within the USA context. So we need to study everything that's avail available to us to reconstruct the context in, in, by region, I believe by region in the USA on the East Coast. And then from there in each region, study, then start to apply the halakha. What you said about the duress, that could be a very good indicator or very a principle in order to establish Jewishness of someone who descends from slavery and slave trade, because they're considered to be Tinok Shanishba, a child who's been sequestered by the goyim, yeah. raised in their traditions. And according to halakha, that person is still an Israelite. The question is, after so many generations and mixing with non-Israelite people, yeah. then how do we determine? Do, can we establish a, 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 a majority, a hazakab based on the majority? Possibly, but in order to do that, we need to do the anthropology first. I haven't done that. So that, that definitely needs to be something that should be funding for to research that. Now, yeah. uh, when we talk about the, the dynamic of, say, African-Americans, say, going to Igbo land. Yes. And in, in proclaiming and saying, hey, you know what? I, this, I, I can't prove it on paper because we were you know, under stress and, and our history was removed and systematically removed. And it makes you wonder like, why did they care so much to remove the history of these people, right? right. So the history was systematically removed from these people. So, but we've, but we've had traditions of Judaism and the only thing we could attach ourselves to was what we had around us, which was mainstream Judaism. Mm -hmm. Is do the people in Nigeria, the Igbos, do they have a reacclimation process do, have they got to that stage or they just mostly been so enclosed into they, they are at the stage they, they are, are at the stage. and that's why i'm reporting and i'm telling you welcome they, uh those that want to connect in such a way will be welcomed by mm -hmm. brothers in Igbo land now, would they do like would it be like a Gersa Humra type of a thing or would it just be like learning the amunana and you know what i mean like how did they yes and partaking of the colonial ceremony. First thing I would say, if that man is not circumcised, he needs to do that first because yeah. it is considered aru. It is an abomination for evil not to be circumcised. Mm. So that's the okay. first thing they will have to do. So it follows the same, the same structure of the Torah. That's the first thing they have to do even before you can even sit down at the table to talk about this. There's a there's a uh, there's a rabbi um, who I've spoken to a few times um, in this chat, and okay. he put a couple of questions. I wanted to see if he wanted to. Rabbi, do you want to come up? I can see you. You want to ask your questions, or yeah, you're okay with that? Hold on. Okay. I'm trying to unmute you. Okay. Ra rabbi, you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. So this person, I want to say. Uh, both of you, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to express and explain not only your experiences, but your knowledge, information about it, this great, I call this the, one of the last and greatest chapters in the diaspora. Mm. So Baruch Hashem for, for what you're doing. And, and you too, Rav Mordecai, uh, much kavod to you. I have, for both of you, I have nothing, but I feel, I feel starstruck right here, okay? You two guys like uh, my celebrity rabbis. I I do have a question because the phenomenon here in the U.S. with African Americans being forced to breed and forced to and I, you already addressed that I think you you said that they they're waiting with open arms. Um, and I, me personally coming through the uh, traditions and sort from Rabbi Matthew. Um, but more from the halakhic aspect of it and knowing what he envisioned. So with that being said, um, a lot of people who are here in America, who are, have their own oral traditions and identify as Jews, may not want to um, join the, the old way with the the Nigerians, although they consider them their brothers. 
what do you see in the future with that group of African Americans? And I really started an organization called West African Jews of the Diaspora because we all been scattered throughout the world and not just here in the US today, or some Brazil and other parts of South America. So what do you foresee based on your experiences, based on what you're working with? I'm right now personally working with um, teaching and hoping to cultivate future leaders under the situation that we are in. I am looking forward to the future. Um, based on what you're telling me, it looks like a beautiful thing that's happening, Be'ezra Hashem. But what do you see? And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts, both of you, if you don't mind. Thank you, Rabbi, for your question and um, bringing this issue. I, I, I have had this conversation before, I think sometime last year, with some people who are part of some type of uh, Hebraic movement among African-Americans in the United States. And I will repeat what I told them. Form your own communities. Form your own communities. Create your own indigenous tradition, which, which brings Africa and also United States and maybe the Caribbean. And create your own tradition in a halachic way and, and, and express it in that way. Make it your own. Because you, I, I believe you are correct. Not everyone wants to go back to the old way uh, uh, and connect with the, with the Igbos. Um, and every community, every Jewish community that we mentioned today has its own identity based on geography and experience. And even co some communities like the Sephardic community uh, that was expelled from Spain and Portugal and went to the Ottoman Empire and to other places in the New World uh, are always remembering Sephardat, Spain, Portugal, always through the language, the food, the music, uh, the way we study the law. And I believe that African-American Jews can do the same exact thing in the USA. Same exact thing. Connect to the old land, express it in the language of the new land and stay with halakha. Uh, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, and we could, and I, and I think it's like, it's about building off of Nigeria, building off of things like Amunana, building off of these mechanisms and, and clarifying that Rabbi Yehuda, he actually has a sudur, I haven't saw yet, but it's the West African sudur. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So these types of tools, I think it's pertinent, you know, to, because I mean, the, the issue is like this, you know, there's people, there's, there's millions of dollars that have been put into people going to India to research B'nai Manasha and other, you know, tribes. And they, they, they have some chazaka, something, you know, it, it's, it's open, but it's, it's there. And, and, and they love the Torah and they're good people. And I met many here in Israel, right? You see a lot of, you know, B'nai Manasha all over the place. And the same thing with, you know, other, other communities, with Spanish communities, these types of things in terms of, you know, those, so I, I you know, it, it seems like, you know, that there should be a, a safe space of development for African-Americans who connect to the Nigerian outlook, the West African outlook, and there should be a segue system into them to, you know, be able to keep halakhic Judaism, you know, and- I want to add something. Go ahead, go ahead, Rabbi, please. I want to add something very important to what you're saying. What we cannot have is people coming to Torah and being disenfranchised by another group of Jews. We cannot have that. And, and that's why I started explaining about Hazaka and all Jews are Jews today because of Hazaka. If one Jew starts saying to another Jew, you're not Jewish or you're doubtful, that person is bringing doubt on, his, on himself and his whole lineage because we are all Jews based on the same exact legal principles. So what you're saying about creating a safe space is so important. You know how many people are alienated from the Torah because they approach a local synagogue and the rabbis look at them and say, who are you? No, we don't want you. They won't tell them in that way, but they will make them feel unwanted. And so that person ends up going to Islam ends up going to Islam 
or to some other uh, denomination. You know, in the United States, we have so many denominations of religions and, so, and people are creating their own religions. Uh, so that's what's happening in the United States. We cannot have that. I believe we have, I believe now, to, today, we have the tools to be able to rebuild all those Jews that have been disenfranchised. That's my vision. Yeah, and in and the, in the, in the, exactly. Um, that that I mean that that's the point, you know, is that we're we're here, and it's, and it's also it's prophetic. You know what I mean? We 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 have an idea that towards the end of days that people will be gathered, people who were exiles, people who were subjugated will be will return. You know, and 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 it's not. It doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, um, a criticism to the overall Jewish community, but it could be a criticism on us as black Jews or Jews of color that we're not establishing that and we're not going out and we're not building those safe spaces ourselves, but rather throwing people who are culturally different in the diaspora, right? Because we're not in Eretz Israel. We're not with the base of Mikdash where everything is clear, right? Yeah. We don't have a Sanhedrin. So when we talk about other communities taking on, it's hard for communities of Sephardic and Ashkenaz, you know what I mean, to 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 deal with each other and these types of things. So I, I think it's incumbent upon us uh, to do this. And I think the trip that you just had to Nigeria really opens up that connection between African-American spiritual healing and the expansion and understanding of the traditions that have been developed in, 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 in Africa that many, the Igbos really feel that this connection goes all the way back to the time of the temple, you know, That's Amun right. and these different things. So, you know, authenticity, these things, it's there, right? But it's not about everyone having to agree with it. It's just more so saying that we're saying that that. So I think we should have more conversations um, about this. Um, I think if there's anyone else that has any specific question, we could kind of, you know, go ahead, Rabbi. Yeah, what just I wanted to say, I think perhaps the video you were not able to share it because you're doing YouTube live. Yeah. If, if you're able to allow me to share a screen, I can play yeah. it. Oh, really? Yeah, I think I think that okay, would okay. wait, hold, let's try to do this again. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, know. okay. So the the Rob made an amazing uh video around his trip. It's 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 uh, hold on, let me see if we could. Let's see if we try it one more time. Hold on. Can, can you guys see that? Do you see anything? Or is it yes. just me? Yes, it's it's there. Okay, so, okay. So let's try to do this. Hold on. Perfect timing. See how everything works out. The Scott could practice. Hold on. Yes. Okay, perfect. There's no sound. That's the only thing. Mm. But it's fine. As long as they can see the video, we'll be fine. Is there sound or no? I 
And I'm here at the synagogue in Oweri, Rabbi Ephraim Uba. Okay. And this is his community. They have lodging here for men and women. There's a kitchen where meals are prepared. You're able to uh, allow me to share screen? Yeah, I could do that. Hold on. Yeah, because I think because you're running the YouTube live. It's ah, cool. that's just cutting out the sound? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. If you, if you allow me to share it, perhaps. So how, do I, how do I make this open? Okay, hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. You see, it's open? Yes. Let's see if I'm able to do that. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yep. So there we go. Let's see if that works. Yes. You can hear it good? No sound? Yeah, it's still not the I think I think it's the live. It should not on yours. Rabbi, they couldn't hear it on that one either? Well, I mean, hey, the link's there. You know, we could put the link in the chat. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. I'll put the link in the chat. Hold on. Jeez. Rabbi, could you could you put the link in the chat? Uh, uh, yeah, let me see. One second. Other people could put it in too. Have you put it in? So, so we'll put it in. So yeah, so I, I think this is the beginning of many other conversations on this topic. Uh, one thing I want to talk about as well is this idea, and I think we could close off with this point, is, is, the, is the idea of this knowledge, right? This information being accessible to kids. So the link is in the chat, you guys, for the video. So everybody who wants to see the video, please share it. It's an amazing video. The Rob should be a director, you know, the way everything was put together. So the thing is, so one of the things that has been talked about a lot with different people is that there's so much lack of information about the African-American experience past slavery, right? And through this knowledge that we, we have, we're not saying, obviously we're not saying all African-Americans are descendants of Igbos, but we are saying that a tremendous amount of Igbos, some people even say over a million, were sold into slavery, right? So I think those are two different points. One is a factual point, and another one could be assumption, right? So what is your thoughts on this information about that dynamic of the transatlantic slave trade along with, along with the history of the Igbo people in general and their connections being put into things like course curriculums and different mediums of education that could be shared to, you know, to schools in America, like regular schools that kids this should be a part of social justice. This should be part of Jewish diversity. And this information, you know, should be in every school district, every school in America. I agree totally with you. You know, one of the things that uh, evil politicians would do is try to erase the history of a people. When you erase the a people that doesn't know its history will, will not know who, who they are. And one of the ways to reconstruct a nation or people is by allowing them to know who they are first. Yeah. And that's something that James Bowen said. You know, he, he used to say that uh, a nation that doesn't know its history is bound to repeat it again. And if a nation doesn't know where it comes from, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. So this, this, that's the first thing. So I totally agree that there's, you know, the educational system at the public school level in the United States, you know, we have Black History Month. That's how I learned about Igbos when I was 17 years old. We were told to read uh, Ola de Uda e Kiano, you know? Um, and and that's, that story, that autobiography was my first experience of Igbos. I didn't know what, that, what, the, what the ramifications were the, like they are today, but that was my first experience with, with that with Igbos, with that name, 
and knowing from that personal ethnography that uh, they were Israelites because he describes himself being as an Israelite, a Hebrew circumcised on the eighth day who kept Shabbat and he was stolen. He was stolen and he was thrown on a ship and he was given a Portuguese name, Gustavo Vasa. I remember all these things from when I was 17 years old from right. reading that in high school as part of our literature. I believe that uh, the his in the history, there has to be some type of education in the USA with the history of different slaveries and ports and, and uh, all these migrations of Africans, where they're coming from, and also to study those cultures by not allowing African-Americans access to that information or even the tools to know how to acquire that information, that is a way to suppress a people. I'm not gonna say anymore because I don't yeah. wanna get in trouble with politicians. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but exactly. that's what it is. <laughs> okay, so Rabbi, I just, you know, I mean, I think I can speak for everybody. This has been a very impressive discussion. Uh, you gave us a clear understanding on many Jewish topics and those those Jewish topics um, has let us be able to understand and have the the, the critical analysis of uh, what uh, you experienced in Nigeria um, with the, the Igbo people. And it's I think it's a new chapter um, with African-Americans, even though it's been discussed before and people know about it, as you said, and mm -hmm. different types of things. But I think we're at a different stage because of technology yes. and our ability to do that. And I think um, one of the things that we'll talk about it in private is maybe to start maybe virtual study groups uh, between African Americans that are interested in to learn about Amunina, okay, and, and to learn about that, and because I know you're working with Rimi and the Defenders and the whole thing, so maybe we could start that um, um, that conversation, you know, and and be able to start that dialogue of understanding because I think this is because for for African Americans it will be probably the first experience of um unadulterated spirituality that they've ever been presented with since they've been in North America. And so um so yeah I, I just think that 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 could be a great first start. And I think there needs to be monies invested into anthropological research which you're based in to um be able to get that structure and to bring out the the, the analytical data um that's associated with real comprehensive rabbinical inquiry. And, um, right. and so I think, you know, we, we, we have to talk about these things and, and find partners that also see the value in these things. And, um, and we'll see whatever, wherever God wants us to go with it. But I did talk, I talked with all the leaders and all the congregations about mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying now. And they all agreed that they, they would like to participate in that. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So again, I thank Rob Yehuda for, uh, for giving us, you know, his perspective and everyone else who asked questions. I'm sorry, we couldn't answer there's so many questions, this group, you know, it's 22 something people now, but we've had over 50 people through this course you know of this. I'm gonna put my, my email address here. Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. People please. can ask those questions there. Um, Perfect. Uh, and also, Robbie, go let people know how they could find you on social media outside of... Um, I'm everywhere. If they just type my name, <laughs> they're gonna find me everywhere. There you go. Uh, you can find me everywhere. Yeah. So that's the email of the Bedin. Um, people can address questions there. And uh, and my name is un underneath. If you Google my name, you will find everything. All my academia, rabbinics, everything's there. So we're gonna we're gonna um we're going to we're going to end the conversation here. Again, we want to thank Darav uh, for this amazing dialogue, and this is going to continue on. You know, this is a mission. This is this is this is part of bringing the Gaula. Like this isn't um, a hobby. You know, this is this is why God brought us in this world. And you took the Rav over there, and you know, I'm so glad he went. You know, because he has such a huge umbrella of thought and information that I don't think people like myself and other people would be able to tap into because the anthropological research and these things are foundational 
for halakhic discourse. And without having that understanding, it would just, you know, be an inspirational trip and these types of things. But now we have bases to build off of. We have bases to communicate with other organizations and institutions. And, um, and, and then what I'm doing is we're gonna take this, the classes, you know, it's up live, whatever, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna upload it this afternoon uh, or tonight, you know, I'm in Israel, so it's already 10 o'clock here. So we're just gonna maybe cut out the first part of it and then upload it on Facebook and re-upload it. And then I'll share it with the Rob and he could share it on his platforms as well. And um, yeah, Rabbi, did you, you put your email in there in the chat? Yes, is there. It should be, uh, let me see where it's at. Uh, oh, one second, one second. Yeah. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's there. Okay. okay, so yeah, so any of the questions that we weren't able to get to, please contact the Rob directly and uh, have that conversation. Um, if for whatever reason you lose the email, whatever, you can reach out to me, I'll give it to you as well. But uh, but again, this is an ongoing conversation. And I personally, you know, uh, being African-American and uh, having ancestries, I see this as, as an awakening and it's, and it's pertinent that we build a relationship with Nigeria. It's pertinent that we build a relationship and that we share resources because there's a lot of things that we have here in the West that shared over in that part of the world could literally change lives. And the information that they have and the history that they have in that part is literally creating life, right? Yes, and, and you know what? They, they, are, waiting. they are waiting for you. Yeah. They are waiting. <laughs> they are waiting. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> move in move in move in exactly okay so yeah so we're good and um we'll just keep talking i mean it's it's like this is an ongoing dialogue you know this isn't like a one-off thing so we're going to close it out here uh we're going to stop recording and um everyone should have a continue to have an amazing week Shavu Tov. and um Again, thank you, Rabbi. Um, just, just for your work and your courage. You know, I was, we're praying for you the whole time here in Israel that thank you should you. be safe. And thank you. You know, it's a risky trip out there. It's not. Yes, a, I didn't even mention those things because I. Yeah, didn't we wanted know, to stay away from that. I didn't want to scare anyone. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be brave over there. You got to be brave over there. That's right. right. <laughs> but hey, you got to be brave for Hashem if you want the truth. You got to be brave for that too. So it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, we're there. Uh, Keish is here, different people, but we're going to have more conversations. But again, uh, we just wanted to thank you. And um, here we'll just end the conversation and then um, we'll resume our normal lives. I'm, I'm going to close down the Zoom, everybody. We'll see you soon. And Rabbi, I'll send you 